Hello, Adam's Child. Welcome to this week's sermon where we take a look at those in the Fallout series that prefer to put holes in their targets from several hundred yards away. We will make this a little bit more interesting, though, by ranking the top 10 named snipers in the Fallout series, and I would love to see if you agree. So, crank up the rads and zero in your sights as we rank the top 10 snipers of the Fallout series. For the purposes of this list, anyone who claims to be a sniper or a sharpshooter is alluded to in lore as demonstrating such abilities or was part of a group that was known for their marksmanship will be considered. This is about specific non-player individuals and not groups or generic members of those groups, so a random ranger in New Vegas with an anti-material rifle won't be talked about. When deciding how to rank these snipers, several factors were considered. The first is their in-game effectiveness, which means looking at their skills or special stats, depending on the game, as well as how good they are when it comes to putting down enemies from a distance. What we can't see is also important though, so stories of past exploits, and in some cases, potential future actions, will also be important in this determination, because sometimes what we see in-game and what we are told don't exactly line up. At the end of the day, someone's true capabilities as a sniper might be inferred to be exceptional because of their affiliation with a certain group, but I might rank them low if there is insufficient evidence to attest to their abilities. If you disagree with these rankings and assessments, let me know why in the comments. I don't know why I felt compelled to say that. This is the internet. Of course you're going to do that. Before I get to the top 10 though, I want to briefly mention snipers that didn't make the list, but warrant a special mention because I know there will be people in the comments asking why certain characters didn't make it into the top 10, so here I am, just trying to cover my irradiated butt. Stockholm is a sniper in Fallout 3 who acts as Megaton's lookout and is a key part of the town's security and defense, along with the brave Deputy Weld. Armed with a hunting rifle and with fairly low small guns and sneak skills, at least for the members on this list, he doesn't have what it takes to make it into the top 10, although he does get points for having voice lines that ask us how we got up to this post since it's inaccessible without glitches or console commands. Farsight is a recruit in Fallout Tactics that can join the player's squad with her specific strengths being in long-range engagements. Although she is quite capable at her job, and her background is described as being taught by her father how to shoot proficiently, she is a playable character, so she's excluded from this list. Christine Royce is a tragic character that we are introduced to in Fallout New Vegas' first DLC, Dead Money, but the Sierra Madre has only just become her prison. Prior to being stuck in Hell on Earth with a bomb collar around her neck, she was hunting down the man that did all of this to her, the rogue Brotherhood of Steel elder, Father Elijah. How Christine ended up in this state is a long story, but what is relevant here is that she went from being a scribe within the Brotherhood to an assassin within a small secretive group within the Mojave Brotherhood of Steel known as the Circle of Steel. She was tasked with tracking down Elijah and killing him as recompense for his failure as a leader and subsequent abandonment of the Brotherhood. Christine would successfully track Elijah to Big Mountain, a place only a mad scientist would love, but before she could use her custom silent sniper rifle to put Elijah down for good, he had caught a glimpse of her because of glare coming off of her scope. Elijah detonated the bomb collars of nearby pre-war ghouls, injuring her and allowing him to escape to the Sierra Madre. Christine doesn't make this list because her small guns and sneak skills are pretty low and the only past sniping history that we know of has been an abject failure. Fallout New Vegas has a whole slew of snipers and we are just getting started with them. Manny Vargas is one such sniper having grown up a member of the Great Cons, running around and causing trouble, mostly for the NCR and its settlers. In a strange twist of fate, something would happen that estranged him with his gang and he would instead choose to join the new California Republic Army, a sworn enemy of the Great Khans. 
It was here that he would be recognized for his markmanship and become fast friends with Craig Boone, a sniper in the NCR 1st Reconnaissance Battalion. Acting as a spotter, Manny would enjoy the lifestyle, but he would leave the army after many of his people were massacred by NCR forces at an encampment called Bitter Springs. He would end up in a small town called Novak, who needed help defending the town from Legion threats in the east and a new ghoul threat from the west. Manny looks over the town during the day from atop his lookout post that if you squint and turn your head, it kind of looks like a T-Rex. Manny's skills aren't attested except for his induction into the well-known first recon, and bizarrely enough, all of his skills are only set to 5. That is, 5 out of 100. And this is a really good example of why we can't lean too heavily on in-game stats. As it stands, Manny doesn't make the cut because we just don't know enough about his capabilities. Knight Captain Colvin is an old and religious member of an elite group of Brotherhood soldiers in Fallout 3's Capital Wasteland. This team, known as Lion's Pride, is a hand-selected team of fighters who coalesce around the daughter of the Elder of the East Coast Brotherhood, Owen Lyons. His daughter, Sarah, is an extremely capable fighter in her own right, and she and her team volunteer for some of the toughest missions possible. Colvin is a sharpshooter, and while he prefers to use his laser rifle, he is able to take out targets like super mutants 200 yards out. According to one account, blowing one's leg off and sending it twirling into the air. He's also seen, or rather heard, reciting scriptures under his breath as he fights, and he prefers to engage from elevated positions to get the best shot. He has a friendly rivalry with the team's sniper, Knight Captain Dusk, about who is the better shot between the two, but since he is only a special mention here, I'm sure you can guess which one of them is better. Now this one should be interesting, but it didn't feel quite right to exclude him, and that is Randall Clark, better known as the Survivalist. Clark is a deceased character from the New Vegas Honest Hearts DLC by the time that we learn about him, but he left many journal entries and terminals scattered throughout Zion Canyon. To make a very long and emotional story fit in here, Clark never refers to himself as a sniper, and since all that is left is his skeleton and some notes, we only have his past exploits to go off of. Clark was a former military man who took refuge in Zion Canyon after the bombs dropped and his family died in the calamity. Clark would survive, even against his own wishes sometimes, but found new purpose in watching over and helping groups of people that moved into the canyon, but doing so in secret, never revealing himself. One such group had come from Mexico and sought refuge in the canyon, only to be attacked by a new group from Vault 22 just outside of Vegas. Clark was dismayed by the violence and driven into a rage to find that the former vault dwellers imprisoned and ate the group he had been watching over. Something broke inside Clark and he began a campaign of complete extermination, setting up ambushes, laying traps, and over the course of weeks he had killed nearly everyone and only took one injury, a shot to his thigh. We can surmise that Clark used a variety of tactics, most likely fairly long distance shooting using his trusty rifle, an old service rifle with a bent front sight. So while it is likely that Clark was a good sniper, we can't really say a whole lot about it, so he remains a special mention. Corporal Betsy is the only female sniper that we know of to be accepted into the NCR's first recon, and as such, we can assume that she has the chops to justify it. One of the problems, however, is that in regards to Betsy, we don't have much compelling evidence in her favor. We know the first recon has been trying to kill leaders of a local raider group called The Fiends, and Betsy claims to have had two confirmed hits on one of their leaders, Driver Nephi, but he's still as alive as he's ever been. Additionally, during another operation, Betsy and her spotter, known as Ten of Spades, were ambushed by another fiend leader, Cook Cook, where he violently assaulted her, the scars of which she still carries. We can see her in action though, along with the rest of the first recon team, if they are asked to assist in killing Driver Nephi, with the courier drawing Nephi out into the open, and the first recon snipers 
all taking him out with a headshot. Lieutenant Gorbitz is the leader of First Recon, and again, we can assume that he is a capable sniper in his own right, although we just don't know much about his background and only see him in action when First Recon helps take out Driver Nephi. The Lieutenant and Corporal Betsy have the same gun skill at 79 and sneak skill at only 17, which isn't great. And for these reasons, both of these members remain a special mention only. But enough of those. Let's get to the top 10 snipers, starting with number 10. We just can't get away from the first recon and for a good reason. They are some of the best marksmen of the NCR's army and are well known for that fact. The difference between those that we have spoken of and who we are talking about now though is that Corporal Sterling was not always in the army. Sterling is the oldest member of First Recon and that is because he spent years upon years as an NCR Ranger. NCR Rangers are an elite combat group who are particularly skilled at reconnaissance, survival and self-reliance, and their combat abilities, especially over long ranges. The NCR owes so much of their expansion success to the Rangers, as they are typically the ones assigned to travel well outside of NCR support, gathering intel, and engaging in special operations. This is exactly how Sterling spent his early military years making multiple expeditions out east as far as the Colorado River. Sterling himself seemed focused on the local groups and tribals that could be found in the Mojave region, all in an effort to lay the groundwork for their upcoming annexation of the Mojave. By all accounts, Sterling loved his work, as dangerous and grueling as it could be, but that would all come crashing down on one fateful day. Sterling would be captured by Legion forces on the eastern side of the Colorado, likely a scouting or expeditionary force since the Legion hadn't amassed on the eastern side of the Colorado to challenge the NCR at that time. His captors took special glee in breaking every bone in his hands and feet, crippling him and immobilizing him completely. Or so they thought. In agony, Sterling crawled towards the edge of a nearby embankment and without hesitation threw himself over the side. He tumbled down the slope and into the Colorado River and given his physical state, that very likely would have been the end of him. But some fellow NCR Rangers had witnessed his escape and quickly made their way to him and fished him out of the river. Although he would heal, he would never recover his full strength or dexterity. He was unable to travel the long distances required of Rangers and he couldn't even properly use his sidearm. Truth be told, he couldn't keep up with the extreme demands of Ranger life and was forced to close that chapter of his life. Unable to truly leave the only profession he had ever known behind, he asked if there was a place anywhere within the NCR military that he would be accepted, and that is when Lieutenant Gorobitz stepped in. Seeing his talent and knowing his history, Gorobitz requested that Sterling be allowed to join First Recon. Sterling's eyes are still sharp, and he's able to use his trusty rifle, a unique lever action called La Longue Carabine, to good effect. Although the only time we see him in action is during the same ambush on Driver Nephi with the rest of First Recon. He has an impressive gun skill at 86, although his sneak is only 16, which may have to do with his past injuries, but because of his experience as a ranger, a pretty strong gun skill, and strong contributions to First Recon, he makes the list at number 10. Number 9 is another person from New Vegas. She's not with First Recon this time though, but she is a ranger. And yeah, I know, it seems like they are the only groups in the entire game of New Vegas that train to engage at great distances. This sniper though goes by the call sign Ghost, which is apt for two main reasons. The first is that she is very adept at remaining stealthy, like many rangers are, with one of the highest sneak skills on this list at 88 when she reaches her max level. She is incredibly observant as well, and will detect the courier coming up the ramp to her sniper's nest on top of the barracks by hearing their footsteps on the wood, unless the courier has 60 or higher sneak skill. The second reason, Ghost, is a descriptive moniker, 
is because she is the only person in the game to have albinism. Her body is unable to create any melanin. That would be a huge impediment in an area like the Mojave because it doesn't almost, it definitely makes you wish for a nuclear winter. Not only does she adapt though, she excels even under these circumstances, wearing a wide brimmed hat, a scarf, and large sunglasses to shade her from the sun. Ghost is unhappy with her post at the Mojave outpost, and not because she's standing all day on top of the barracks in the glaring sun, but because of the signs of an upcoming all-out war between the NCR and the Legion. Truth be told, that's why she's pretty cranky and treats everyone around her like crap. In addition to this, she's unhappy because she's stuck at the boring Mojave outpost, stuck in a narrow strip between two cliffs, where not only does she not see any action, but her main strengths and skills are severely curtailed. With a gun skill of 88, which is also amongst the highest on this list, she can deal out good damage with her cowboy repeater, but because of where she's stationed, we never see her in action. The only time she can be observed throwing lead from her sniper's nest is if the player decides to spice things up or has joined the Legion. Hey, come on, we've all had our wild days. Some people party and some people crucify degenerates. For number 8, we travel all the way across the country to Boston, where if we are lucky, or maybe unlucky, depends on your level of bloodlust I suppose, there is a chance to meet a man known as Absalom in a random encounter. We know precious little about Absalom or his background, only that he is always hostile towards the player character, the sole survivor, but he is apparently not instantly hostile to everyone. He can apparently get along with Minutemen. Absalom is clad in combat armor and is sporting a hunting rifle or sniper rifle depending on his level and since Fallout 4 moved away from skills to perks, we can't see a specific number attached to gun and sneak proficiency, but we can do something else. Nearly all the perks that enhance sniping in Fallout 4 fall under two special stats, perception and agility. Perception has the rifleman, sniper, and penetrator perk while agility has sneak and ninja perks, the latter of which makes ranged sneak attacks much more effective. Looking at Absalom, he has a 10 in perception, so conceivably he could have all the sniping related perks, but a shockingly low agility of zero. Yeah, zero. Can he even roll out of bed in the morning? That said, the main reason he even made the list is because in Fallout 4, he is one of only a handful of human NPCs that will scale with the player all the way to level 50, making him a threat for a good portion of the game and a worthy adversary. Except for me apparently, not even Absalom can withstand Adam's judgment. Ending his reign of terror will elicit quite the response as he dies and says, well that's never happened before. Number 7 is the lone entry from the first Fallout, and it is the fan favorite, Tycho. Tycho is one of, if not the best companion to have in the first Fallout, with an interesting backstory and proficient combat skills. Tycho is a Desert Ranger, which is a group of post-war survivalists that originated from the wilds of Nevada, and he comes from a long line of Desert Rangers who are very adept at wilderness survival exploration, and long-range combat. Tycho doesn't talk too much about his past exploits, but based on his years of experience as a Desert Ranger and his in-game skills with a starting proficiency of 56% in small guns, if equipped with a hunting rifle, or better yet, a sniper rifle, he can be a considerable threat. He starts the game with a shotgun, so not very snipery, and while he technically can shoot burst and automatic weapons, it's a bad idea to give him one. Similar to Ian, you are just asking to get mowed down by friendly fire if he has anything that isn't single shot. So among the weapons he can use, the highest damaging and least problematic for you as the companion is the sniper rifle. Tycho makes it to this spot on the list because of his background as a desert ranger, high small gun skill, and the fact that the best weapon he can be equipped with is the sniper rifle. That is about as good as we could hope for.
At number 6, we have the first entry from Fallout 3, a rather mysterious yet completely hostile man known only as the Drifter. The Drifter won't hesitate to put a bullet through whatever he sees from his perch and the partially destroyed Dickerson Tabernacle Church, especially the Yaogwai that prowl not far away. The Drifter wasn't always here though. In fact, at one time he called one of the most unique places in the entire capital wasteland his home, known as Oasis. Oasis is a hidden... Uh, yeah, well, Oasis is probably the best term, where vegetation grows easily and in great abundance. These plants come from a most unusual source, a West Coast mutant who had been subjected to FEV years ago and had a most unusual characteristic. A tree began growing in his head unabated, and by the time he left his home in Old California and trekked across the wasteland to DC, the tree had subsumed him, rooting him in place in the location we now call Oasis, with thick, lush greenery sprouting up all around. This kind of environment is entirely out of place, and a small group of people gathered here to witness the very real miracle that was unfolding around them, and they decided that Harold had to be a god of some sort. So started the Tree Minder cult, who protect and tend to Oasis, and this for a time at least was the home of the Drifter. This is evidenced by his tree minder hood that he is wearing and a map of where to find Oasis that he has on his person. But we also read in the game guide that he was cast out from the community long ago. He doesn't remember much of his time with them anymore though and spends his time on the lookout for incoming threats and stealing from other wastelanders when chance permits. The Drifter has the highest small guns and sneak skill of anyone we will talk about from Fallout 3, at 88 for both at max level, and is equipped with a unique sniper rifle called the Reservist's Rifle. That rifle is nicer than the normal sniper in many ways, like higher critical, larger magazine, and more HP. The Drifter is always hostile, and his elevated position can make for a good fight, although he is really let down by his lack of decent armor. It's also just so perfect that he sights down the scope with his right eye while wearing an eye patch. That is just mwah, chef's kiss. His in-game stats, unique weapon, and ability to live in such a dangerous part of the wasteland surrounded by Yao Guai and only a stone's throw away from the Deathclaw Sanctuary get him a spot on this list. For number 5, we are once again in the Commonwealth with one of the funnier characters that we'll talk about, the old crusty survivor, Barney Rook. Barney is not the most polite person in the Commonwealth, but being the only survivor in a settlement destroyed by mutated crab monsters will do that to you, I guess. Barney has lived in Salem, or what was Salem his whole life, and comes from a long line of Salemians. Salemites? Salemese? After the Great War, Salem was able to develop into a fairly prosperous town, but over the 200 years since the bombs dropped, their prosperity led to complacency. Salem became no longer prepared to adequately defend itself from external threats, something that Barney Rook tried to point out many times to the town's council. He wanted money set aside to build up defenses and train a local militia in order to defend their prosperous little settlement but was unable to convince them to do so. Because, you know, the Commonwealth is notoriously safe with uh, death claws, dinosaur-sized crabs, and synthetic humans who will replace you in your sleep. Yeah, maybe they deserved it. Barney, for his part, prepared for the worst, and the worst came from the ocean. A throng of mire lurks emerged from the depths and swarmed the town, and Barney was the only one ready. Most people were killed or run off, Barney estimates that he only saved one person for every three killed. Whoever was spared being crab bait did not stick around, and it wasn't long before Barney was all by himself in the once prosperous town. He refused to leave though, and this is exactly where the sole survivor can find him during the events of Fallout 4. He is facing off against Mirelurks that are gathered around his house, since the sole survivor kicked up the Mirelurks again, and he tells us to come take shelter after killing the ones right outside his home. He will rip us a new one, especially if we shot and destroyed any turrets we saw in Salem, 
and asks for help in getting those turrets online. While he is a deadly shot with his trusty rifle, Reba, that he made with his own hands, the turrets help cut back on the amount of work to keep the Mirelurks back and they had been turned off recently because of low activity. In return for helping him, he will allow the player to have his new gun that he was working on, Reba 2. Now that is some creative naming. Reba 2 has some upgraded parts and the Exterminator perk, which does more damage to bugs and Mirelurks, so Barney knows how to exploit their secrets. Even though he displayed impressive ability in the defense of his town and has continued to survive, his in-game stats are not that great, with a perception and agility both of 4, which is enough to get the Rifleman perk and an upgraded Sneak perk, but is otherwise pretty weak, and he wouldn't have made it this far on his list if we didn't know so much about his past history. Speaking of pretty crazy backstories, number four on this list is yet another crazed lone survivor of a tragedy. Man, Fallout churns out trauma like finals week. Known simply as Arkansas, this old man, clad in raggedy clothing, has quite literally dedicated his life towards revenge, using his trusty sniper rifle and a mountain of landmines. Arkansas grew up in a community in the capital wasteland known as Ridgefield, and this group consisted of the descendants of military survivors that roughed out the Great Atomic War and subsequent struggle for survival. We don't know exactly when, but when Arkansas was a young boy, slavers, the scourge of the capital wastes, sent a team to capture as many people as they could at Ridgefield and shoot whoever they couldn't. Arkansas was hidden well enough that he wasn't taken, but he was the last remaining survivor of the slaver attack and was only interested in exacting revenge. After an unknown amount of time, Arkansas practiced with his sniper rifle, honing his skill, found and placed enough landmines to stop a small army, and began spreading rumors that Ridgefield had a new prospering community. Like clockwork, the slavers heard these rumors and they couldn't help themselves approaching the town for part two, like the world's worst sequel. This time, however, they weren't met with a group of people they could just slap slave collars on. They found themselves being blown up by mines with each advance while taking accurate fire from a house at the center of the town. Arkansas exacted his revenge, killing the raider group to the last man, which attests to how good of a shot he is, as well as the tenacity of the slavers. Like really, no one said, screw this, after half their group had been sniped and blown to bits. The complete loss of a slaver group made waves at Paradise Falls, the de facto home base for slavers in the capital wasteland. And when they found out it was the result of one man, they put a bounty on his head. Arkansas remains in the old town of Ridgefield, which is now called Minefield because of the World War levels of mines he put everywhere, and he is hostile towards everyone, including the Lone Wanderer. Approaching the town, Arkansas will immediately start shooting near the player, targeting nearby cars with the intent to set them alight and make them explode. This devious old guy cannot be interacted with and either has to be killed, or if the Lone Wanderer is working for the slavers, he can be enslaved and sent back to Paradise Falls. The slavers are extremely happy should this happen, contemplating just torturing and killing him outright rather than selling him, but if Arkansas is enslaved and then freed afterwards, he will be friendly to the Lone Wanderer, and this is the only way that he will ever not try to shoot us, which is ironic because we're the reason he even became a slave in the first place. Arkansas's stats are quite good, 79 small guns and 79 sneak, and he is equipped with a sniper rifle. So with great stats and an impressive resume, Arkansas comes in and number four. We are now in the top three, the three best named NPC snipers in the Fallout series, and third from the top. We remain in the Capital Wasteland because it is Knight Captain Dusk of the Brotherhood of Steel. Dusk is a member of the vaunted group called Lion's Pride, the hand-picked group of people that we spoke of earlier when we were talking about Knight Captain Colvin. Unlike Colvin, however, she has a very impressive resume 
and once again we can assume a certain level of proficiency because she is among the elite fighters of the east coast. Being in Lion's Pride and all, Dusk is the sniper of the group, being equipped with a sniper rifle, and although her in-game stats aren't as impressive as even Arkansas that we just talked about, with 70 small guns and only 16 sneak, what we see of her and what she has done before makes up for that. Dusk is very confident, and she's a no-nonsense type of fighter, seemingly only able to maintain a competitive friendship with one person, the very same Knight Captain Colvin. And she attributes this attitude to being one of the few women that are among the best fighters within the Brotherhood. She says a lot of things that sound like bluster or bragging, so we have to do some work to parse what is true and what isn't when it comes to her stories. She can be found up in the Bailey quite often, where she is doing live fire drills, in fact, more than any other character. While there, she is extremely critical of her performance, being upset at minor mistakes and flaws as she tries to stack shots perfectly on target. She has a particular affinity for headshots, often advising people to aim for the head in order to dispatch super mutants quickly. She speaks of blowing the head off of anything over 200 yards away while out with the group, and she thinks that her rifle can penetrate Enclave Power Armor helmets at 100 yards or closer. I mean, she also says that any super mutant within a half mile of her and her rifle will be dead, and that she can single-handedly end the entire super mutant threat, so yeah, she can get kinda carried away. What isn't disputed though, is the fact that she has a very high kill count, higher than Colvin, who is another well-respected marksman in the Pride, and she can be seen taking shots that the Lone Wanderer physically can't pull off. Near the end of the main quest, when the Brotherhood is using Liberty Prime to wrest control of Project Purity from the Enclave, she can be seen outside of the Citadel, firing across the Potomac, a distance that the game physically won't even render, so if you wanted to try and show her up, you just literally can't. That said, even with weaker stats than some of those that we have mentioned, her quest for perfection at the firing range, her well-known exploits, and her body count make her number three, even if she does herself no favors by exaggerating a bit. Number two, who do you reckon it could be? Well, Let's pack things up and head back to Boston, because it is the former foul mouth, Robert McCready. McCready is the only person on this list that is a recurring character. He was previously seen in Fallout 3 as the mayor of Little Lamplight, an exclusively child community that he would be kicked out of at 16 like all Little Lamplighters. He would begin his adult life in the wastes as a gun for hire, wandering around looking for work. He grew to be a crack shot with his rifle, and eventually he found a woman who he would fall in love with and have a son. Unable to divulge the truth that he was a mercenary, he lied to her and told her that he was a soldier, a lie that he would never get a chance to correct because Lucy would die one night in an old metro station, attacked by feral ghouls. McCready would survive with his young son, who was the only good thing he had left in the world but even that would take a turn. His son would get sick with blue boils all over his body and with no Wasteland doctors able to help and the condition getting steadily worse, he picked up his rifle and set out to find a cure. With his son being cared for by friends, he headed into the Commonwealth because he heard the gunners were recruiting fighters and paying good money, money that he needed to keep up his travels and search for a cure. The gunners paid well for a reason though, they didn't care what the job was as long as someone paid and McCready started to have serious internal conflict between what he was ordered to do and what he knew was right. He would eventually leave the gunners, but still needed to take jobs in order to make ends meet, something that his former employers did not appreciate. The gunners don't play nicely with competition, and when McCready set up in Good Neighbor as a place to take clients and conduct business, the local gunner leaders, Winlock and Barnes, would threaten and try to muscle him out. Such is the state of things when the sole survivor first meets him, right after a hostile confrontation with the gunners. McCready can be recruited by the player for a sum of caps and is a solid fighter with his sniper rifle, and his stats are top notch where it counts. A 10 in perception means he can benefit from rifleman, sniper, penetrator, and concentrated fire perks, all things that would be incredibly useful for a sniper build, and a 10 in agility, which means he could max out Sneak, Action Boy, 
ninja, quick hands, and gung fu perks, which would all once again be a huge help for his fighting style. McCready will ask the Soul Survivor to help in dealing with Winlock and Barnes, and assaulting their gunner base and killing them is meant to send a message to leave McCready alone. You know, something tells me that's not how they operate. Maxing out McCready's affinity will grant the Soul Survivor the Killshot perk, which grants 20% increased accuracy in VATS when aiming for the head. And McCready can easily show off his sneaking abilities by effortlessly stealing from other NPCs when ordered to. Strong and Hancock, two other companions, will comment on his combat ability, with Strong thinking that he's nearly as good a fighter as him, and Hancock saying that he's a hell of a gun to have behind your back. He is also constantly commenting on the surroundings and thinking of their combat utility. He will call some areas good sniping positions, and sometimes when traveling at night, he can sense upcoming ambushes and will mutter that he doesn't like the feel of things. All in all, McCready demonstrates incredible skill as a sharpshooter, and even if he isn't the most flashy, I think he deserves the number two spot. And number one, if you've been paying attention, then you know who hasn't been mentioned so far, and really it is undeniable that the Fallout New Vegas companion, Craig Boone, is the best sniper in the series. It is hard to know where to even start with Boone, so let's start with his past, talk about his present status as a companion in New Vegas, and end with what his potential future could be according to his end slides. Boone's early histories intertwined with the special mention, Manny Vargas. Both of them had been identified early in their careers in the NCR Army as having remarkable marksmanship skills, and they were given placement in First Recon. Manny was Boone's spotter, and they would become fast friends. Where Manny avoided being deployed to Bitter Springs during the massacre, Boone actively took part in it, being part of the group that was positioned at the main escape route they knew could be used in a potential flanking maneuver when the fighting broke out. Boone and his fellow marksmen were set up on the Coyote Trail Ridge, and as the attack commenced, they saw many people starting to flee through the canyon. One thing was clear though, these weren't fighters rushing to flank the main NCR attack force. They were women, children, elderly, and injured folks that were trying to escape the NCR attack. Through bad intel and a blunder on the part of NCR leadership, Boone and his fellow soldiers were ordered to shoot and not allow anyone to escape. Reluctantly, Boone followed his orders, but his actions and those of the NCR would have such a profound effect on his psyche that he, along with Manny, would leave the army the first chance that they got. Boone was in a bad mental place, and perhaps this is why he fell so hard and fast for a woman he met in New Vegas, a woman named Carla. They married after only a short while, and Boone was the happiest he had been since Bitter Springs, because she helped him forget the horrors of the massacre. Needing work though, Boone and Manny would find a job as lookouts for the small town of Novak, but this decision would bring about even greater troubles. Carla was unhappy in the sleepy little town, and made her dissatisfaction known to everyone around her, becoming quite unpopular with everyone, including Boone's good old buddy, Manny. One night when Boone was posted up in Dinky, wow, what a sentence, a secret group of legionaries would sneak into Novak and abduct Carla right from under Boone's nose. Boone was devastated, and at first he received mixed reports. Some said she had had enough and left for Vegas, but that didn't make any sense because she was pregnant with their child. Boone would uncover evidence of an insidious plot, convinced that someone in Novak had betrayed him because the kidnappers somehow knew exactly how to evade his watch, go straight for Carla, and disappear into the Mojave just as quickly. Boone didn't know who to blame, or why. All he knew was that he had limited time to save his wife and unborn child. Boone quickly set off, with no help from his once best friend, since Manny seemed somewhat pleased to have Carla out of the picture, and Boone would end up finding her. But the scene was grim. Near the Colorado River in Legion territory, he was scoping a Legion position and saw her face amongst the numerous slaves that were being put up for auction. With dozens of Legionaries between him and his wife, 
and precious few minutes to spare before she would be sold and whisked off, unlikely to ever be found again, he made the impossible decision to grant her the only mercy he could. The one thing that short of saving her could spare her the suffering she would endure at the hands of the Legion. He lined up a shot and pulled the trigger, killing his wife. The sharp crack of the shot immediately sent Legion guards in his direction and he was forced to flee and good old Boone was able to evade all Legion efforts to recover him. Boone would try to pick up the shattered remains of his life, but he was worse off than ever before. Sullen, jaded, and consumed with anger. All he could think about was getting revenge against the Legion and finding the person that had betrayed him by selling out his wife to the Legion. Such is the state of things when the courier first encounters Boone. He isn't exactly what I would call friendly on the first encounter, but upon the first meeting, Boone sees an opportunity. Since no one knows the courier in Novak, he asks that they go around the town, talk to people, and see what can be dug up about his wife and who may be responsible for her abduction. Whoever that person is, he wants to take revenge the only way he knows how. He asks the courier to take the guilty person out in front of Dinky the Dinosaur at night and to put on his first recon beret. That will be the sign for Boone to line up the shot and put an end to the person that inflicted so much pain. With one shot straight to the head, he will kill whoever the courier brings out there. But if the courier did their job correctly, then they will have figured out that the guilty person is Jeannie May, the owner of the Dino D Light Motel. Jeannie did it partially out of the spite she has for those that are not from Novak, but also because Carla had been unkind and pretty unsufferable after moving to Novak. She worked out a deal with the Legion where she would give them information on how to come in undetected, grab Carla, and get out with a nice fresh slave. Even after finding the person who led to Carla and the unborn child's abduction and death, Boone still carries deep wounds. He will agree to come with the courier, not having any real reason to stay in Novak, and he is so good in combat that having him is almost like playing the game on easy mode. Boone swiftly and accurately dispatches enemies with his unique scoped hunting rifle and can even don first recon survival or assault armor as well. Boone will scale with the player and at max levels will have the highest numbers we have yet seen, maxing out the gun skill at 100 and his sneak skill at 100 as well. He is also hostile towards the Legion and anyone with sympathies to the Legion, including the courier so taking him to Legion occupied areas will always result in a giant gunfight and well that just makes sense. He will also give the courier the spotter perk which highlights enemies when looking down the sights. A good indication of Boone's skill comes from some of the potential endings that he can face depending on the courier's actions. Depending on whether or not the courier helps him work through the trauma of Bitter Springs and losing his wife and depending on who is in control of the Mojave will affect what he does. With an NCR victory, he will actually re-enlist to the army, but spend all of his downtime out hunting slavers in the desert, putting them in the dirt one by one. In a yes man or house ending, he can become a security guard and caravan scout, or even a mercenary and assassin if he completely abandons his morals. If the Legion wins, he will either plan a suicide mission, where he will go and try to kill as many legionaries as possible until he is captured and later crucified, but not before spitting in the face of Legatlanius, or, and I think this is the best showcase of his abilities, he will live out in the desert and begin a one-man war against the Legion. He will actively hunt down Legion officers and take them out from a distance, with each successful kill increasing his bounty to unprecedented levels. But no one is brave enough to take him on and claim the bounty, so Boone continues his campaign of terror. I don't think I have to say much more to justify Boone's position at number one. With potentially the best stats of anyone in this list, a history of impressive and tragic exploits, incredible in-game performance, and legendary potential in the post-game, it all adds up to hands down the single best sniper in the series. That is it. Let me know if you agree, disagree, and anything else you would like to add to the conversation. 
Thank you for being here with me today. And thank you to my supporters who go the extra mile to show appreciation. If you would like to say thanks, you can do so by supporting me on Patreon or YouTube, like these fine folks, or you can just do it any other way you see fit. Supporters get a Discord role, get to vote on and choose future videos, and can play with me in Fallout 76. A big welcome to the newest supporter, and 94. Adam is pleased. As always, a huge thank you to my top tier supporters. Acrid B, Arctic Snowpup, Gardner Minshew Simp, Tessa Storm, Dommy Double, Tapey Papey, The Alt Vault, Juan Vader, Good Old Welshaw, Braden Daniel, Tyler Eaton, Owen Balzer, and and 94 and and had to make that difficult didn't you remember to take care of yourselves and all of adam's creations and i will see you soon